Hey everyone. We are going to look at some code today. This is the developer manual. So um, I work in software and uh, the best way to learn a code base is to have someone that knows the code base talk with you about it. And um, I thought this would be a really simple way to kind of capture that same practice, but do it cybernetically so people in the future can uh, just listen to me talk about this crazy thing for 20 minutes, half an hour or so, and hopefully that'll inspire you and get you further along than if you were to try to just learn it from scratch. Um, so we're just going to dive in. Um, just making sure, trying to get my font a little bit bigger for you all. All right, that's pretty good. Okay. Uh, I think the first place to start is arcologies.lua. Um, so inside this, uh, the first thing this does is it loads an includes file. And we'll jump to that in a sec. But first, I want to show you the lay of the land of this whole first file. Um, inside a net, we've got a whole bunch of other nets. Uh, we're setting a few global variables. We're setting up our encoders. We're setting some counters. Uh, there's actually three separate counters that run in Arcologies. One for the UI, the screen, so everything you see on the screen. One for music, and then one for any of the grid interactions. So those are all separate, and they're not. Um, that that gives you more control over over everything. And then there's also um, a couple clocks that help with redraws. And uh, there's a dev mode, which we'll get into. Actually, let's start that right now because we're in, we're in the dev world. So if you create your own, if you create your own file called config underscore, you can override any of the config settings. So I've got a uh, dev mode flag here, and you can see if config settings dev mode, so if that's set to true, it's gonna load a scene for us. And this lets you quickly set up test cases. So um, we'll definitely hit this in a minute, but I have dev mode turned on right now. No, I don't. Now I do. And you'll see when I hit enter, um, this jumped us to the cell designer page and it has the solarium created with a charge and it's running. So this was in that scene that I had set up as I was testing these. Uh, back in, oh no, we got a crash. Oh, we got a pinwheel. Crash. Sublime. It's like, it's like Norn's bit it too. That's going. While well, that's going, all right. So where were we? Um, all right. So dev mode. It's true, load up a scene. And then there's only four other methods in here. And these are 
the stock ones that um, when you write your Norn scripts, Norn sees these ones and uh, it does extra things with them. So there's the redraw, which is gonna redraw our screen. Uh, encoders, the control, the spinning encoders on Norns, and then keys, which control the keys. And then all of these, um, you know, this is just a really thin wrapper around all of these other methods. So um, there's a lot of comments in here about what they do. Keys and encoders are really straightforward because they only have one function. So it's pretty quick to learn these. You can see encoders, E1 always scrolls through pages, E2 always scrolls through the menus, and then E3 always scrolls through the values. And then whenever that's done, we're gonna call the dirty screen, which then redraw will know that if the page is dirty to re-render the page. Um, all right. Norns is back. Um, Okay, so the includes is the first, first really important thing to learn. So includes is what includes everything in the lib directory, which is short for library. Uh, here's all the stuff that comes with norns. So crow, Euclidean rhythm, file select, music utility, text entry, tab utility. Here is the config file. Um, so yeah, we'll just go in order. That'll be the structure of this video. We'll just go through the includes and then we'll talk about each one as we go through it. I think that'll be logical. So config is where essentially the um, behavior of our colleges is composed. So we have some global settings like major and minor versions, um, playback, length. These are the global settings that you'd set you know, back here. So we'd see, uh, you know, if we're playing, this playback is gonna be set to one. So we could we could query that right now if we wanted to and go, uh, it's paused, it's still paused. Uh, why is that? Oh, because these are just the defaults. These are the defaults. So yeah, that's good. That'd be very bad if I had done that and that number changed. <laughs> so the, the config is just the default set when everything's loaded up, that's what it starts with. Um, what's interesting is this is where the menus are composed. So home items, so these are what's on the home page. Uh, these are all the available structures. These are all the available attributes. Um, Here's where we compose what attributes different cells have. So hives have metabolism, shines have notes. Um, if you just like copied and pasted these into another area, I haven't actually tried this, it's kind of fun. <laughs> Suddenly our solarium has <laughs> these, these attributes on it. Um, it's not going to actually do anything because the solarium doesn't have any logic inside the keeper or have anything that cares about range. But anyways, that goes to show you, you can make your own structures. You could probably make some pretty cool structures, structures with just these existing attributes. And then uh, we have our pop-up messages in here too. Don't really have a better place to put these. And um, yeah, this is, don't, don't worry about that. Just, just, just don't worry about that one. So inside includes, um, here's the config underscore file. So if that exists, we're gonna load it and then you can override any functions. This is get ignored. All right, the cell. So the cell is in just the solarium with a min and max range is freaking me out. Okay, great. Um, 
you know, before I go any further, because we're going to be using this this whole time, um, the dev class, dev table, this lets you compose scenes. So we could, in this scene, um, <clears throat> it's one. So if we go to our config, we change our scene to one, save it. Um, it's going to load this other scene, which has, uh, we're on page three. We've selected the fourth menu item. Um, we've created a cell on the grid. We have opened all the ports. We've deselected the cell and set the beats per minute. So I was testing something here. And uh, if I wanted to do the same thing, but start on page two, now we're on page two. If I wanted to have the cell selected on that page, now we're on that. Um, this makes testing and developing much nicer because you're not spending half your time setting up a test case on the grid and then changing one line of code and then wasting a bunch of time doing that over and over again. So you spend 30 seconds and compose a test case, test case for yourself, and then you develop with that. Um, so I just have a few scenes set up. This was, uh, I was working on Ode to Joy, trying to get all my keys right. These numbers are totally wrong. Um, this file should probably be get ignored, but it's not because I've also got some utilities in here that will be useful for other people. So you can type screenshot at any time to take a screenshot. Uh, WTF scale spits out all the notes in your current scale. Um, KC is just an abbreviation for keeper selected cell, which is whatever the currently selected cell is. So that lets you do things like this. We could change Oops. Um, we could change this to a we could change this to a veil just with that shortcut. And then there's arc debug, which is helpful to just get a lot of stats about what's going on inside our colleges right now. So we have a very simple arcology with just a veil um so let's let's change that veil back to a let's change it to a you know a gate and then um we just debug again and then we have a gate all right so back to includes we're moving to the cell which is the core concept of arcologies interacts with signals so cell is uppercase because it's one of the two things that I really treat as an actual class in, uh, in the application. So it's setting a meta table, it has the new method. When you instantiate it, you give it uh, x, y, and g. So x is the x coordinates on the grid, y is the y coordinates on the grid, and then g is the generation. So we should be able to just, um, well, we, we could, create a new cell right here, but it's not going to be in the keeper. So, you know, it's, it's simply, um, I'm jumping ahead. We'll, we'll get to that. I'll show you in the keeper how that works. So you just pass in these three attributes. Sometimes you don't actually need uh, a new cell to be created. You just need to access some of its attributes, in which case you can just do cell new, and then you'll get a kind of a dummy cell that's at zero, zero as part of the zeroth generation, so it won't impact anything anywhere else. Structure key is the key that maps to this table. So one is hive, two is shrine, three is gate, four is rave, five is topiary. Um, so this is loading a lot of the attributes and things from the config file we just looked at. This is saying the structure value. Uh, we, I have this kind of poor, poor man's GUID 
generator that's going to give us a ID that has um, it's the OS timestamp plus a incremented number. Um, so it's it's pretty good at ensuring unique IDs. I tried to have an actual GUID generator in here, but it totally tanked performance, so I took it out. And this is this seems to be fine. There's probably a way that collisions could happen with this, but I haven't encountered it yet. Um, index is the location on the grid, so there's 128 different parts of the index, and you're either at one or you're at 128, so it's just rows of 16. This is used to compare when collisions happen. So instead of comparing X and Y, which is two attributes, two values, we just compare is the index equal to itself. Um, flag is just a general flag for using through the collision lifecycle. Um, so different cell structures can use the flag for different things. It just means, hey, it's my time to do something. It's just a multi-purpose flag. Uh, these are all the traits, which are all of the different attributes are encapsulated in separate trait files, which are just right next in the includes right here. So uh, capacity is a good example to start with because it's really simple. So it's just going to default to four. And then there's a setter that clamps and then a callback. And all of these traits are nice and short like this and it makes it much more maintainable and easy to understand what's going on it's like here's the network trait we have our network of 26 letters and um, some setters so all the traits are in here even ports are a trait this is the most complicated trait and Structures are not a trait, but metabolism is a trait. So all those are in there. Um, so then after we init all those, we run the setups and all those. I, I was running into some really weird issues with this where if I had this just sort of floating up here, I was getting weird behavior. So it just felt better to just have a setup function. All right, so to do shame, there's got to be a better way to do this. This is the this is the lookup function for the um, everything you see here. So left column is what's displayed on the menu and then the right column is what is returned as a value over on the side. Uh, Note and note number one. Note says, I'm the same as number one. Number one says, always have been. This was, I touched on this in an earlier stream. Um, there's a lot of different ways this could have been done. I felt like the notes were important enough to have their own attributes instead of having them all in a table. Uh, is it, it's still a very conflicting design decision for me. Had I not done it this way, this would be the only attribute that would need a like a multi-dimensional table for it to work. So I I just wanted to keep it simple. Um, but I, I still have very complicated emotions about this. Here's some nice helpers for you. So you can see, you can check um, You can check if a structure is something, or you can check if a structure has something. So I know we have a gate selected right now. So oh, I changed it to a, I was looking at arc debug up on the screen. We have a um, forest selected. So that works anywhere. You can just check the cell, ask what it is, and then you can also um, see what the cell has. And the has looks up from the uh, config, um, all these right here. So this does not have, well, 
let's ask it instead of, do you have an index? Do you have a network? Do you have, wait, you shouldn't have a network. That's a bug. Forest don't have networks. Huh, I wonder, did I actually phase this out? I might have actually, all right, I'm gonna log this as a potential bug because that should have been false. You can set the structure by key, so you can set it by key or has is by value. Um, prepare for paste just gets this all ready on your clipboard to be pasted into a new spot. And then from here out, we get into what's essentially descendant class behaviors. Since all cells can change structures at any time, it makes no sense to actually implement classes for each one. That would result in lots of creating and destroying objects for no real benefit other than having these behaviors encapsulated in their own classes. And as of writing this, there's only about 40 lines of code below, which there's a little bit more than that at this point, but I'm still happy with this. So here we get into um, what each of the individual structures do and how they work. So when a cell changes, if we're changing into a shrine, we want to make sure there's only one note. If we're changing into any of these three, we want to make sure there's eight notes. Um, we want to make sure that the crypt has an index of six. Most other cells have an index of eight. And then we want to make sure we cycle the state index, which that's one trait I should probably touch on. That's kind of like the flag. It is a trait that simply keeps track of cell state like which note to play next, but different cells can use it for different things. So it's just like a little pointer that says, it's like a cached state of the cell. Like, hey, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on number three right now. Like our forest is on number five. So this index maps to the state index. Uh, these is spawning covers all of the structures that spawn cells. So there's different logic for that. This is all this reads pretty clearly. This is just checking. Um, this is doing the checks to make sure the beat lines up with the offset and the metabolism. Uh, sometimes cells need to set up like Rave does drugs, LOL. Uh, domes set the Euclidean rhythm. Maze increments the shift register. Uh, solariums check to see if they're at capacity. So these are the things that happen right at the very start of each beat. Teardown is what happens at the very end of each beat. So if the solarium is flagged, then we switch the flag back and invert the ports. Um, so this is a specific one for solariums. Um, this is going to compare the capacity and charge, the rave, you can fire off callbacks for any of the traits. You can fire off callbacks for anything, but it's only used in the traits. So when you change the state index on a crypt, we want to make sure that we load a new crypt up. Um, when you change the metabolism and the thing has pulses, we want to make sure that the pulses equals the metabolism, just stuff like that. Uh, and this is really gross. It gets into the menu and submenu stuff. So this is, hopefully you don't have to go into that. This was a, this was not fun. All right, so we covered the cell, we've covered traits. So if you wanna add your new, if you wanna add a new trait, you need to add it to the config file inside um, the attributes. These are just alphabetically organized. You want to 
add it into the constructor in the cell. So that's going to be up here. So you init it, and then you give it a setup method. Um, we'll get to the keeper collision. And then depending on what you have to do or what kind of attributes it has, you'll need to do some work in the menu, scroll value, and cell to get menu value by attribute and load. So load is where saving and loading happens. Ooh, that was a lot. So that was, that's probably the most complicated part of Arcologies. And from here out, um, it's pretty flat. The keeper's really complicated, but the rest of it is, that was probably the scariest part of the whole thing. Signals are really primitive. They just have a XY, a heading, and a generation. Generation refers to um, this number, which is how many beats have elapsed in the overall arcology. And that's used for um, essentially, it compares, it's used for some comparisons, but then it's also used to send cells into the future. I'm still working out how to send them into the past. It, I, I don't think that's possible, but you can create some signals, for example, like two generations from now, and then they won't appear until two generations from now because they're not actually drawn and um, available to be interacted with unless their generation is equal to or less than the global generation. Propagate is how signals move. So if the signal heading is north, then decrement the y so go up one if the signal heading is east, increment x1. If it's south, increment y1. And then if it's west, decrement x1. And then we check to see if it's in bounds or not. And if it's not in bounds, we delete the signal. Uh, functions. And how are we doing on time? We're 30 minutes in. OK, we're doing pretty good. So um, collect data for save. This is where we load up the global data about the arcology. Then we loop through all of the cells and we insert them into um, data, which is this temporary table here. And then we do a deep copy on that, which is like a recursive copy, and then we do the same thing with signals, and then we turn the data, and then that's what gets written to the file. And then load is just the opposite process, so we open up the Arcology file, uh, take everything we just saved, put it where it needs to go. The So here's an example of instantiating cells. So in order to get all the cells loaded, we have to create a new cell, we feed it the x, y, and generation to instantiate it, and then we go through and set all the attributes. And then we set the available ports, and then we just insert it into the keeper. The keeper is like the state machine. That's what keeps track of the cells and the signals and what's going on. Let's get it nicer. So all the, all the all the interaction logic is happening, all the, the physics, if you will, is happening inside Keeper. Same pattern with signals, much simpler. Uh, just some simple getters and utilities, get a random number on the X, get a random number on the Y, uh, toggle, playback, flip a coin, Find the nearest value, check if something's in bounds, check if the grid's connected or not. I don't, this probably isn't the best way to do this, but I can, this works. Um, these are kind of cute. So, dirty grid, if you give it a Boolean, 
it'll set grid dirty to that boolean. If you don't, it just returns what it is. So you can both set and get with this function. Same with uh, dirty screen and break splash. Break splash breaks the splash screen. That's the, the Northern information logo at the start. Ah, uh, the lost souls. Um, this is our seeding algorithm. This is, people were asking questions about how this works. Uh, these are the cells structures that are available for seeding. I didn't want like Crow or MIDI to be um, randomly seeded because not everybody has Crow or MIDI devices. So it wouldn't be fun to, and even me, like I'm sitting at my desk right now, I don't have my Crow here. I don't want to be seeding Crow structures. So here you can see what we're allowing in and not um, pretty much opening all the ports if it's something that makes noise, uh, mixing up the offset and metabolisms, randomizing some stuff. Crow is where we control the crow. Counters is those three counters I mentioned earlier. So there's the, uh, the conductor, which is for music, the optician, which is for the screen, and the grid meister, which is for the grid. And even though they're all going at the, well, these two are going at the same rate, this one's based on the BPM. Um, here's our redraw clock. So this is gonna redraw both the screen and the grid for us. The conductor has an intimate relationship with the keeper. It's what keeps the keeper in time. So it's conducting the keeper. So it sets it up, it spawns signals, propagates signals, collides signals, that's signal on signal, collides signals and cells, deletes the signals and then tears down and then redraws. Uh, Optician has this concept of quarter frames as well as frames. So some animations I didn't want that fast. So this is just mod four, so it's a slower um yeah that's counters docs is where all the docs live so this is what's displayed when you go to a cell these lines here they're just broken up into tables much better than trying to do something clever and intelligently like parse a line and break it up into sizes, just make a silly table and make sure it looks good on the screen. Um, file system where we read and write. So we got some paths. Uh, this is how it loads. Again, I got this from It's Your Bedtime's Build of Orca. Well, thank you. Save. Scanner crypts, ignoring license and readme. Uh, I don't like this, but I, yeah, someday. Um, set the crypt. So anything with the file structures in here. G is the grid. So this one should be, yeah, this one's, this one's pretty gnarly. Um, a lot of attributes to look at what's going on with the uh, state of the grid. So are we pasting? Where what's toggled? What's the counter? How long are we have we dismissed something? How big's the grid? So this is going to dynamically set up our index. Um, so our redraw clock. When you press a key, what happens? It's 
basically what's really nice about this application is all the key presses do like there's no modes on the grid it's if you're always on your arcology there's no sub menus there's no I mean, all that matters is if a cell is selected or not. If a cell is selected, you can toggle the ports. If it's not selected, you can't. And whenever you press anywhere, you're gonna select or create something. Which is right here. So if no cell is selected and we do a short press, select one and select also creates it. Uh, and then it also pops us to the, it's gonna pop us to page two and um, highlight the structure option for us. Uh, if you press the same cell again, it deselects it. If you press an adjacent cell, it toggles the port. And then if you press another cell, it just selects that. Long press is gonna copy to your clipboard and you can see it said copied hive and then pasted. Uh, anything with the LED prefix is just going to be about how and when it lights up. Uh, yeah, a lot of this here is just animation. Um, ley lines are the, were a much more integral concept, but I think this is probably my first time even mentioning them. Ley lines are just the the straight perpendicular lines that come out of a cell when you select it, it's the highlighted row and column. And they don't do anything, they're just decorative and they're lit up at the lowest value, which is one. Um, these are all broken out into separate methods because they're kind of nuanced with uh, the direction they go. If it's going up, we are going to zero we're checking if we're going to zero, if we're going down at 17. So there's just like some weird, or it's eight, nine, whatever. There's just some weird things you need to do. Um, and then also to accommodate for the ports because cells at the very top row can't have a northerly port drawn. So there's all these things. So these are just separate methods for that. Glyphs. Uh, before we do glyphs, let's look at graphics. Anything you see on the screen is inside graphics. This is a massive file. This is this is the biggest file in the whole thing, but it's all it's all like you know, this is 16 lines to just have the the this animation happen. Um so this is a lot of like primitive stuff in here. Uh, here's here's a splash screen. This is really cool. Um, there's random elements every time, so every splash screen will be different. Uh, the most complicated stuff in here is definitely the the graphs for the analysis page. So here we get into some trig, um, drawing sectors. Here we get into line graph. Uh, here's the beautiful little mini grid from uh, Okirion, which was in his um, grid test script. So this is really, really helpful. This is where I got the idea to use the index to compare things. And if you're drawing stuff, know that there's, um, I have these, You'll see MLRS and MLS, that means move line stroke. So I just simplified this instead of typing screen. I didn't want to type this 5,000 times, which like literally there's, I don't know how many, how many times does this appear in this file? Uh, Oh, let's just forty one. So I didn't want to type move 
line rel stroke or screen level move line stroke 41 times each so that's just abstracted out okay glyphs is oh wait actually back in graphics um you do need to set your your map for what structure is with its glyph so the aviary is the aviary the casino is the casino and then same with the palette uh which is the the palette is this so this is where this is drawn and all the glyphs come from glyphs.lua so this is another pretty massive file we're drawing all of these line by line chunk by chunk so some of them have shared components like a gate has uh, the kasagi is the very top part it has a three-quarter wall on each side and then it has a second floor and a third floor so you, you could probably make a lot of pretty cool glyphs with just like these existing little macro composer things but i mean a lot of this gets really really just i mean i was we're we're very sensitive to the pixel okay um we're gonna do the keeper last because i don't know we'll just do it now so keeper is a state machine for cells and signals a lot of the higher order logic happens here for example solariums absorb signals to increase their charge and then invert their ports and release once the capacity is met solariums have charge and capacity but don't know what to do with them this is where the keeper comes in Furthermore, signals know nothing about cells. Cells know nothing about signals. Keeper Collide is the great atom smasher. So we already looked at Counter's Conductor to see how it's all orchestrated. Uh, Keeper wants to know if a cell is selected. It wants to know what its ID is, its X, its Y, um, more information about the cell, if there's a copied cell. These are where all of the cells in the arcology and all the signals in the arcology are saved. These are where the new signals are held until the next generation to be copied into the above line. And then these are the signals that are queued up for deletion. All right, collision. So collision happens between signals and cells. All collisions result in a signal being destroyed, so we're going to register its destruction, and then we're going to draw that destruction. Uh, now we get into all of our behavior for each of our structures. So if you're a gate and we hit a closed port, then invert the ports. Uh, if we're any of these, don't do anything. I wanted to be really explicit so that if you're searching for this about like, oh, how does the hive work? You would see like explicitly that it doesn't have to do anything here uh, crypts play samples shrines play notes uxb plays midi aviary plays crow solariums set the charge topiaries play and cycle casinos play and cycle tunnels broadcast these are all the structures that reroute and split and this is some syntax sugar for create signal. Um, I can't think about how to best say it, so I just called it tomorrow. So create all these signals on the next generation. Uh, this helps tunnels broadcast. This is probably one of the most important functions in the entire script. Are signal and port compatible? So if the signal is headed north and the southern port is open, we're gonna return true. If the signal is headed east and the western port's open, we're gonna return true. Spawning, this is going to say, okay, is the cell spawning? And if it is, which port's open? And if that port's open, instantiate a new signal there, 
And since we know what port's open, we know where to put it next. Uh, we got setup. This triggers that setup method on all the cells. We got teardown. That triggers the teardown method on all the cells. Propagate triggers propagate on all the signals. This is where signals collide with one another. So we're comparing. Um, there's some reason that I wasn't actually comparing the index, and there was a good reason for it. I don't recall what it is right now. Uh, yeah, so that's the keeper. Select cell is pretty important. That's going to create, um, this is where cells are created. So new cell equals cell new XY counters music generation. And then we're gonna insert it into that table that we saw up above. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll just keep going in order. So menu is going to help us with all our menus. This is um, actually pretty complicated too. What do I want to say about this? Uh, there's a lot of really specific things this does. I don't like how it's not brittle. It's just really, this isn't scalable. Like if there were a hundred structures in Arcologies, this would not be how I do this, but because there's only 15 right now, um, it didn't need anything more substantial. So this is gonna build out, so like this little, for example, this right here is going to insert the caret right before the value. This is, this is really, really it's, it's, it's the view layer of the MVC if you wanna think about it that way. So there's a lot of, things just to make it look nice. You know, like with the crow, we wanna, crow stores the output as either one or two, but um, we wanna display one, two, and three, four, because that's better for the user. Um, this pops our ellipses at the bottom and the top when we scroll. So this is how it knows to draw that over. Um, this populates the menu with the, uh, no, this, sorry, this is scroll value. So sadly or cleverly or lazily, whatever, we're just matching on the string. So if we're on page two, which we are, and we have note number three selected, which is this string. We launch a pop-up for note number three and encoder. And if we have um, structure selected, we launch the pop-up for structure. So this lets you map your attributes to how, what they actually do, because some some are going to cycle, some are going to set. Cycle means it wraps around. Uh, some are going to launch the pop-ups. Docs have nothing; they are automatically selected when they're toggled on. Which is you can see that right here. Um, so that's menu. 
Uh, I kind of want to do page next, but maybe short. This is just going to connect to our devices. And my super rudimentary, all the MIDI control is just these two lines. I know this isn't, there's so much more that can be done with this, but it's good enough to ship. Page is the last complicated file. Um, this is going to grab some page titles, see what the active page is, see if there's any errors. Uh, page scroll is what is encoder one does. Page select is what encoder two does. Um, oh, wait a minute. Page set. No, I take that back. Sorry, page select is what what scroll calls. So this is where you can um, uh, I think we can just yeah, you, you can just change your page with this method. Uh, this is, this renders the home page, checking all of our states with everything. This renders the cell designer, this renders the analysis, and we have our error message. Parameters are where the Norns parameters are saved. So we have save, load, BPM, seed, crypt directory. Pop-ups, pretty gnarly. This has, this is whenever you uh, go to change notes. This is what takes over the whole screen. Or when you go to seed. These are both pop-ups. So we want to know if it's active. Um, the encoders wait for you to stop spinning, so they wait half a second. So as long as you keep moving it, the pop-up's going to stay open. But as soon as you take your hand off of it, after half a second, it'll drop down. But that value is instantly committed. So you could perform a shrine or something by... Uh, You know, like if this is being hit with signals, you could actually play play it like this. It doesn't need to go back to the to this page for that note to be committed. Um, yeah, just controlling logic for pop-ups should be pretty straightforward to add another one. S is soft cut. So inside this, we set everything up, and uh, here's our really rudimentary one shot implementation. If you know soft cut, this should be really clear. If you don't, you're like me, and I just copied and pasted things until it made sense. Um, and then almost done. Yeah, sound. Best for last, this is going to play, this is going to set our scale for us, build our scale. It's going to snap notes when we cycle through um, different scales and uh, set our playback, toggle the playback. So whenever you press key two, this is the function that's being called. Get reasonable note, probably my favorite method name I've ever written. So get the middle of the road root note. So this is gonna look at our root note, our scale, and then it's gonna find something that's roughly in the middle because I didn't want 
because that's going to be something that's audible. I didn't want it way at the high end or way at the low end. I wanted something somewhere in the middle. But the scales all are all over the place. There's some that only have like 50 notes in them or something. So you can just say, give me the note closest to 72. And yeah, that's, um, I think that about wraps it up. Yeah, I'll do it. Thanks for watching.